Hi, I'm Gareth. This is Brian. We're from Netflix. Thanks for coming to part two of the Netflix invasion of the Jenkins User Conference. We've got three talks going on today all together. Over the last couple of years, Netflix's streaming movie and TV ser service has moved almost completely to the cloud using Amazon Web Services. Uh, you guys may well have seen some of the great presentations and blog posts by Netflix engineers that talk about all the cool things that we do in AWS and um, running the streaming service in production. But how about what it takes to get that service into production in the first place? This talk is going to delve into our build and deployment architecture and concentrate on how we use Jenkins as the centerpiece of our production line for the cloud. Brian and I work on the engineering tools team at Netflix. Um, there are actually six of us from our team here today. So if you're interested in how Netflix does engineering tools or anything that Netflix does, or especially if you're interested in working with us, um, just find somebody wearing some Netflix gear and talk to us. Um, our team's responsible for making standard tools for all our engineers to make building, testing, and deploying their products simple and pain-free. We're now a pretty big team. I think there are 13 of us all together with a fairly diverse range of skills. Everyone can go pretty far up and down the stack. Um, one exception of that is don't ask me to do any UI work if you don't want your eyes to bleed. <laughs> Our team runs the Netflix continuous integration infrastructure. That includes a common build framework that we wrote to make it as trivial as possible for developers to create new builds for their products. Among other tools that we wrote are the bakery, which creates custom machine images for deploying our services into the cloud, and also Asgard, the now open sourced AWS management console that you can use to manage pretty much every aspect of your AWS deployments. Um, for anybody using AWS, I strongly encourage you to take a look at Asgard. Um, it's a really awesome piece of software. And more on all of these pieces of software is coming up later in the talk. A little bit of history on Jenkins at Netflix. We've been using Jenkins and the product that shall not be named before it uh, since about 2009. It's become a vital part of our CI infrastructure. And usage of Jenkins caught on really, really fast, um, partly because Jenkins makes it nice and easy for people who aren't professional build engineers to use it and to set up new builds, and also due to the common build framework that we added on top that makes it a trivial operation to set up a new build job. Uh, in fact, Netflix's product teams don't have full-time release engineers. Um, our engineering tools team handles all the uh, Jenkins configuration, and we aim to make the build, test, and deploy process trivial, en trivial enough not to get in the way of the product development so our engineers can spend time adding cool new features to Netflix's service rather than spending all the time wrangling their builds. And Jenkins has been a huge help with that. We've become one of the bigger Jenkins users um, by far not the biggest, I found out when I attended the Intel guys Planned Parenthood talk. They're an order of magnitude bigger than we are. Um, but we are pretty big and we grew pretty fast. That's given our team quite a few challenges in meeting the increased demand. Uh, we've come up with a few custom plugins, some management scripts, and some usage patterns for Jenkins that save us a lot of time and we think are pretty cool. Uh, they certainly make our lives easier and hopefully they can make your lives easier too. We'll share many of those in this talk. Let's take a little bit to set some context of what we build using our CI infrastructure and Jenkins. To move our streaming service to the cloud, we re-architected pretty radically from a monolithic Java web app that ran in a data center into many individual modules all implemented as loosely coupled web services, usually implemented as web apps or shared libraries. Um, most of those services implement a server and then a client library that can, other services can use to talk to that service. We decided that the unit of deployment for those services 
would be an entire machine image, the Amazon machine image, or AMI for people who aren't um, familiar with Amazon Web Services. That's a complete description of a server, including the operating system. It's not just an install package. Um, that frees us from having to maintain any kind of configuration server like Puppet or Chef. And it makes it very easy for us to roll backwards and forwards between versions of a service that's deployed on AWS. All we have to do is kill instances of a version that we don't want anymore and spin up instances with a different version. Netflix is all about continually trying out new features and rolling forward as fast as we can. And if we really have to roll back, do that as fast as we can too with minimal impact. And having the AMI as the unit of deployment really helps with that. To generate those custom AMIs, we maintain a base AMI that encapsulates our selected operating system, which is currently CentOS, Linux, soon to be Ubuntu, uh, plus a host of other basic services that provide things like monitoring, logging, web and application servers, uh, and much more. Then we have the application called the Bakery that I recently mentioned just now. Um, that handles the installation of the Netflix-specific services onto that base AMI to create a custom AMI that we can then deploy. Once those AMIs are ready, we deploy them into auto-scaling groups in AWS. Those are um, groups of servers that you can scale up and down in an automatic way based on the various criteria for system load, um, user load, other uh, statistics. And to do that, we use Asgard, which I mentioned earlier. Notice that a key aspect of having all those shared services, which are loosely dependent on each other, is that each service team has to rebuild pretty often in order to pick up the changes from the other services that they depend on. That's the continuous part of continuous integration. And that's where Jenkins comes in. Oops. Here are a few details on how we build all those cloud services now that you guys have a little more understanding of what we build. Here's an overview diagram of our build and deployment pipeline. Um, we can provide this entire workflow using Jenkins jobs um, with the help of our common build framework. The common build framework is based on Ant. Um, it implements a set of common targets that all the builds can use all the way through from syncing the code up to deploying it into AWS. Um, if you guys think Ant is getting a bit long in the tooth, so do we. We are working on a brand new build framework, which is based on Gradle, but that's still a work in progress. For the continuous integration to run all those builds, we picked Jenkins, as you know, because it's very feature rich, it's easy to extend, and as Justin from Netflix mentioned earlier, it's very easy to extend without having to write a lot of plugin code. You can just do it with scripts. And it has a very active and helpful community. So thanks to all you guys for being part of that community. For our version control, we use Perforce mostly at this point. Um, it's arguably the best centralized uh, version control system you can get, and it scales nicely up to our kind of scale. But we're making increasing use of Git. Um, There's kind of a grand swell of developers starting to use Git pretty extensively. We're starting to support that, especially on our open source projects, which are all hosted on GitHub. And we use Jenkins to build all our Git projects as well. Once we have uh, binaries uh, produced by the builds, the library jars or the application war files, we publish those to the Artifactory binary repository tool. That lets us access and add to the metadata for all those published artifacts and also allows us to integrate in Apache Ivy to do all of our dependency resolution. Um, the common build framework has knowledge of um, <coughs> the resolution uh, workflow, so each project only has to know about its immediate dependencies, and Ivy will handle all the rest. We then bundle the jar and war files into RPMs, which go to a custom YUM repository, 
And finally, we do the bake and deploy process, which I mentioned just now. The common build framework has ant tasks that access the APIs for the bakery and Asgard to run those operations. Um, being able to do that workflow from a Jenkins job can save teams a lot of time. Uh, one example is that our API team was able to move from one deployment every two weeks to multiple deployments per week. It's also worth mentioning that that full automated deployment lifecycle is mostly used in our test environment where you just want to spin up a new version quickly so that you can run tests against it. Um, deployment to production needs a lot of extra checks and balances that tend to be very specific to the service that you're deploying. And a lot of those aren't yet fully automated, although we are definitely moving in that direction. Here's a quick overview of how easy it is for a team to set up a new build job in Jenkins. You pretty much only need two pieces of information, one of them being um, where to find the source code in source control, add in the common build framework to that as well. <clears throat> and then finally, just specify your ant build file and what targets to call from it. Most of the targets people call are standard targets implemented by the common build framework, so there's very little custom ant coding to do. Another um, aspect of not needing uh, full-time release engineers to do the builds. But even this minimal setup can be pretty tedious when repeated for a large number of jobs that we have. So we're working on a plugin to make that even more trivial. And Brian's going to talk about that a little bit later on. <coughs> um, another little illustration of how to set up a new build job are the ant build XML files and the Ivy XML file that you need. Um, as you can see, the build file is very trivial. It just pulls in a template, in this case, to build a web application. Um, that template includes all of the standard targets that you would need to um, compile, test, build, bake, and deploy. Then the ivy.xml file, you just really need two sections. Well, the publication section pretty much is just telling the build framework what type of artifacts you want to produce. Uh, the build framework has all the, has the knowledge of how to produce those. Um, and then you just list your direct dependencies in the dependency section. So again, that's pretty quick and trivial to set up for a new build. So now we know how the continuous deploy, uh, build and deployment pipeline works. Let's take a little look at uh, how we use Jenkins itself as the core of that infrastructure. <laughs> Uh, and I'll also go over a few other interesting use cases that we found for Jenkins. Jenkins at Netflix is definitely not just a build server. Um, here are a few more uses that we've found for it. Um, at its heart, Jenkins is really just a nice job scheduler. So there are stacks of other things you can do that don't involve building. For instance, our Cassandra team is responsible for all of our data storage in the cloud has their own Jenkins instance for monitoring the health of all the Cassandra clusters, which is a, a large number of EC2 instances, and also performing automated repairs on those if problems happen. This one's a really good testament to how easy Jenkins is to use. All that our team did um, was to give the Cassandra guys a basic Jenkins master setup and a few slaves, and they, they set up all the build jobs, they set up a custom dashboard to display all the job results, and they even managed to turn the blue balls for build success into green balls somehow, which I subsequently found out you can do with a plugin, but I was pretty impressed at the time. <laughs> <coughs> um, as I alluded to a little bit earlier, we can also run automated integration tests, including bake and deploy. Um, and another big use of Jenkins we have is to manage not only Jenkins itself, but um, the rest of our build infrastructure and our AWS environment in an automated way. We have a, quite a large number of system groovy scripts that we do uh, that housekeeping and monitoring with. Brian will describe some use cases for those later on in the talk too. Um, we've started to post these scripts to the public scriptler repository so that you guys can download them and use them yourselves. They're, nice examples of how to dig into the Jenkins um, data model. 
Um, so please check those out. We'll be adding more to, and we'd love to get comments and suggestions on those. A few statistics about Jenkins' usage at Netflix. Again, not quite as big as the uh, Intel guys, but we have about 1,600 active job definitions. 50% of those are triggered by SDM changes. So if somebody makes a change that affects a large number of jobs, we can get up to um, 800 builds being triggered. So the queue fills up pretty fast. Um, a change to the common build framework, for example, which most people check out in their jobs, will generate about 800 builds. <coughs> On average, we do about 2,000 builds per day, um, but obviously when we get a, something like a, a build framework change, that will go up quite significantly. So we have some scaling challenges there. We're currently running at about two terabytes of build data for job configurations and history and um, saved artifacts. And we have over 100 plugins installed, which brings its own challenges of upgrading, testing that the new plugin versions are still working, et cetera. So we've definitely got some, some large-scale challenges that we needed to address. Here's the current Jenkins architecture that we have set up at Netflix. Um, we use a single master. It's currently running on a physical server in our data center. Um, unlike a lot of shops, we use the master strictly as a build orchestrator and for running our housekeeping scripts, we don't actually run regular builds on the master, um, mainly to isolate the load of running builds to um, the build slaves. We use um, quite a large number of slave servers, as you can see on the left and right sections, to actually run the builds. Um, our standard slaves live in AWS. They're actually located in the US West one VPC, Virtual Private Cloud, which is a VPN equivalent that lets you uh, bridge between your data center machines and your AWS instances as if they were on the same network. Um, the US West 1 VPC is actually located down the road physically from our physical data center, so we don't have any problems with latency or response times. Each of the slaves can execute um, four simultaneous builds. And we normally run anything between 10 and 30 slaves in the standard slave group, depending on demand. We also have set up custom slave groups for requirements such as um, groups that need large amounts of resources, more CPU or memory, for instance, to run tests, or to run a specific kind of compiler. We have some teams that need a specific C, C++ installation, which we don't have on our standard slaves, which are mainly used to build Java apps. We make a lot of use of slave labeling to control the type of slave that each job runs on to make sure that jobs don't land up on the wrong slave and fail. And we actually have housekeeping jobs that make sure those builds are using the correct labels. Um, to vary the number of slaves in a slave pool, it's um, a manual operation, but all you have to do is run a Jenkins job to do that. Just type in the number of slaves you want in the pool hit build now, and then it will happen all for you behind the scenes. Brian will talk a little bit about that, how that happens later in the talk, too. Um, the other main aspect that's worth calling out here is on the right-hand side of the diagram. Um, because it's so easy to set up build slaves in Jenkins and have them register with the master and start running builds, we let our individual product teams maintain their own slaves. <laughs> We have a lot of um, teams, for instance, our um, client teams that are responsible for building the Netflix players that run on all kinds of different hardware like um, TVs, DVD players, smartphones, tablets, possibly toasters coming out next year. Um, they often have requirements like they need to run on Windows or OS X um, instead of Linux, like our standard slaves, or they might need some compiler or some other piece of software that has a license that they can only run on a specific machine. To um, update the standard slaves, we just use um, an rsync process. We keep the standard set of build tools on the master. And then every time the slaves are restarted, 
we have a startup script that asyncs the latest version of the tools over to the slaves. And again, that gives us a fairly simple process and avoids us having to use anything like Puppet to do the slave management. That single master has definitely worked pretty well for us up to now. It's reduced maintenance overhead. And um, thanks to continuing performance improvements from the Jenkins community, it's actually scaled up pretty well to a large number of builds. But we are starting to see some cracks around the edges. And um, it's a single point of failure, obviously. So we're starting to run up against a number of scaling issues. And at this point, I'm going to hand over to Brian to uh, describe those scaling challenges and how we met them. Thank you, Garrett. Hope everybody's uh, still awake at the post-lunch uh, coma um, is wearing off. Um, I'm going to speak on the uh, scaling challenges that uh, some of the scaling challenges that Gareth mentioned, um, and uh, talk about some ways that we've addressed them and some other things that we've done with Jenkins that we think are pretty cool. Um, so some of the things that we've encountered. Uh, in using Jenkins, uh, especially at our scale, um, uh, are things like thundering herds, clogging up Jenkins, um, and not only clogging up Jenkins, but clogging up downstream systems from Jenkins. Um, to give an example of that, when we update our build framework, as Gareth mentioned, uh, that's going to trigger all of the SCM trigger jobs that also depend on the CBF. Um, we can scale our slave pool up, but once we do that, we're now pushing additional load out in Artifactory because all those slaves are now resolving and publishing and pulling down dependencies from Artifactory. So we have to sort of balance the needs of Jenkins versus the needs of Artifactory and make sure that we're not killing ourselves and just pushing the problem upstream or downstream. Um, in addition, you know, making global changes across jobs, making sure plugins can ha uh, work from job to job um, or version to version. Um, Backing up that amount of data that we're we're pushing out daily um, is an incredible uh, challenge. You know, and our goal, of course, is to have one button, build, test, deploy with as little human intervention possible, and uh, make the developer's life as pain-free as possible. And uh, these scaling challenges do get in the way of that. Um, one of the things we're going to begin working on uh, soon, and we've been talking about internally, is actually coming with a slightly different architecture. Uh, and we're looking at a sharded model right now. Um, the current thought is that we will split the current master into a few different uh, EC2 instances uh, that will be dedicated to different types of work, like CI builds, integration tests, non-Java builds, whatever makes sense in the context of what we're doing at that time. And what would that'll afford us is that now the set of plugins that we use for each master um, they can be streamlined to fit each type of job, and we can isolate long-running jobs. So maintenance on the main Jenkins master won't take out a 10-hour running integration test. Um, and then we can also do scheduled maintenance against integration test servers in a more controlled fashion, and uh, it actually makes things a lot easier for us, ultimately. Um, we'll also be using the uh, same bacon deploy architecture that currently powers our streaming service uh, to run the actual Jenkins slaves and masters. So actually bringing up and uh, bringing up brand new versions of slaves and things of that, of that nature will be uh, very, very simple. Um, to actually deploy the Jenkins master, our plans are to use the exact same red-black uh, deployment principle that we use to deploy our streaming services in production. Um, we'll actually launch and test the master in a, in a fashion that prevents it from taking on traffic um, when we're satisfied with where the Jenkins installation is, we essentially flip a switch of sorts that will make the test uh, instance become the master. Um, to go into a little detail on that, um, there's a little EC2 background in here. Um, our infrastructure depends heavily on the uh, Amazon Autoscaling Group, which is essentially a cluster of machines that um, is sort of self-managing. You have a bunch of nodes that are essentially identical, or actually completely identical in ways. Um, and if one of them disappears, Amazon handles bringing it back up. Um, you can even feed back metrics into Amazon and say, here's my CPU for this, this auto scaling group, or here's this other metric that's important to us. We need more, we need less, uh, or even on a schedule. Uh, we don't do anything from these hours, take all these nodes offline, and things of that nature. Um, 
So we'll have a live ASG with the master that's running current builds, and we'll have a new ASG with the test instance. Um, what we'll do is we'll store the jobs on EBS volumes, and EBS volumes in Amazon parlance are basically persistent storage devices. Um, and this also ties into backup in that we can use EBS for things like snapshots and things uh, to help us back up and, and, and be a little bit more resilient in case of failure. Um, so we'll store the job data on those Amazon EBS volumes. Um, and that data will also be synced regularly from the live manager to those standbys, um, which we'll also have running in separate ASGs. Um, when it comes down to actually failing over or switching, um, our thoughts are to use Amazon Elastic Network Interfaces. And essentially that is, is a hot, movable network interface um, bound to an IP address and a MAC address that you can move amongst servers pretty easily. Um, so the idea is, again, to take that interface, pick it up, move it over here, that mi machine starts taking on uh, traffic, and uh, hopefully everything works and we don't get called. Now, we haven't actually really fully worked all this out. It's kind of uh, ideas at this point. Uh, we'd definitely be interested in hearing anybody's experiences with rolling a uh, HA uh, solution. CloudBee's HA plugin actually looks pretty interesting, too, so we're going to be talking with them and investigating that to see what we can do there. So um, again, if you guys have any ideas on how we can do this or you've tackled this, uh, any information would be great. In our heads, we do. We don't really do anything yet. <laughs> this doesn't exist, except for basically on a napkin and this slide. <laughs> and a whiteboard. And a whiteboard in Midgard, our, uh, our office room. So. Um, so we set up an actual Jenkins job to actually package up Jenkins. Um, we have it pull uh, a URL where the Jenkins uh, wars are uploaded. Um, we then take that war file, grab it. Um, we take our list of plugins from a list that we maintain externally, uh, and then we take that and bundle up in an RPM, uh, similar to how we bundle up all of our other applications. Take that RPM, we bake it, and we can then deploy it using all of our existing tools, which is fantastic. Now, we could have used the standard Jenkins RPMs and gone that way, but this also lets us take advantage of all the other infrastructure that we've got out there. Uh, we get some services like monitoring, logging, um, Apache pre-configured, the Netflix Tomcat, um, all of our application stack and tools, and it makes things very easy, um, especially when folks in other groups need to get out and hop on a slave and, and jump around or uh, poke around there. It looks just like any other cloud machine to them in the way that we've configured things, which is very, very useful. We will be. Oh, you will. Okay. Yeah. Um, do you currently have a strategy about doing any sort of uh, SCM storage of previous Jenkins job <coughs> configurations so that you can roll back the previous ones if you need to? Um, yeah, I think Brian's actually going to talk about one strategy, though I am for that, which is the job DSL plugin yeah. that's coming up. Um, we also currently, because the current Jenkins plugins don't handle um, backup of the system configuration, for Jenkins, um, we just have a Jenkins job that uses the URL trigger to, to check when the file changes and just checks it into our internal GitHub repo. And this next slide kind of goes into what Gareth was hinting at here. Um, you know, how do we change everyone to a new version of a tool or add a plugin to everybody's job or make other common configuration changes so we can make sure jobs are built in a consistent fashion? We're talking about 1,600 jobs here, so going through and clicking or it's, it's a nightmare. Um, so, you know, we looked at the configuration slicing plugin. We actually use it and it's great as long as you want to change the things that the configuration slicing plugin knows about. Uh, if you want to actually go beyond that, you're left to extending it. And that's just, you know, as Justin said, you want to try and avoid monkeying with plugins as much as possible. Um, so Justin actually went ahead and wrote this awesome job DSL plugin. Um, he, it basically allows you to specify your jobs uh, with a groovy DSL. Um, very, very simple. Um, and you could use templates and things like that to simplify and do inheritance and things like that uh, much easier. Um, Justin could probably tell you more about that than I could because there's a lot of stuff under the hood that's great. So I'd highly recommend talking to him about that. Um, so a quick peek at how easy it is. If you take a look at the left here, Tommy Lee Jones is what you would do. Um, Will Smith is the new hotness. You know, you look at the, you got the, 
a small segment of what it usually takes to go through, say, a Netflix uh, job and configure it for the first time because we have enough plugins in there that you could scroll for days and days, browsers crash, it's, it's a horrible situation. Um, on the right, though, it, a lot of that gets condensed down to a few lines of very simple declarative uh, DSL. Um, you can actually take that and make that simpler, too, by templatizing that and inheriting. So we can say, this is going to be great for 99% of our jobs. Um, what do we need to change? The, the SCM URL. So you could essentially take all of that boilerplate there and only insert the uh, SCM URL for your project and the name of the project two, three lines of configuration, and you can use that. Check it into version control. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, the plugin will also automatically apply changes and things like that. I mean, it, it, it's really cool. And then propagate changes through. It, it's very, very cool. I definitely recommend checking it out. Um, I believe it's on the Jenkins uh, repository now. Um, more things we do for maintenance, uh, Je uh, Gareth uh, mentioned that uh, we use system Groovy scripts to do uh, cleanup of old job configs and associated artifacts. Um, jobs will do things like disable jobs that have been failing for 60 days or more. Some people will set up jobs, forget about it, leave the company, something goes on. That job's been building and failing repeatedly, repeatedly, eh, we don't want to deal with that, um, especially when uh, we do a CBF change and we trigger those 800 jobs. We don't need those guys clogging up the pool when we know they're just going to fail. So we disable them and send out a shout to the owners or who we can figure out the owners are and uh, let them know things are going on. Um, do things like apply consistency across our jobs. We do a lot of that now. The DSL, pl 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 uh, the DSL plugin will hopefully uh, do away with a lot of that, which will be great. But uh, we do currently have a lot of jobs that we'll go through and ensure things like workspace names are set up in a con uh, consistent uh, fashion, uh, things of that nature, um, really good stuff. Um, it's interesting to note, too, that a lot of the uh, prototyping of things like our, our Simeon army, the, the various cloud monkeys, was, was done in uh, Jenkins and through uh, various jobs, uh, which is actually pretty cool. Um, to get to use uh, those for more and more too, which is great. Um, to help us keep builds actually moving through the system, we definitely keep the slave fleet in shape. Um, like I said, we have system groovy scripts that do all kinds of things, and we have th jobs that will watch over slaves uh, in certain configurations and complain when a specialized slave goes offline for a period of time, for instance, um, and, and let the team know that, hey, your slave has not been available to actually build the code, and it's been sitting in the queue forever take a look at this and figure it out. Um, we also wrote the DynaSlave plugin to help manage slave registration, isolation, clean up after disconnect, and things of that nature. Um, and a quick note for anybody that can't make the lightning talk later on this evening, um, the DynaSlave plugin really is very simply uh, a plugin that allows for slave self-registration. Very similar, in fact, completely inspired by what the Swarm plugin does, but simply exposes a URL to do it through. Um, We'll be open sourcing this plugin, so if you want to check out the lightning talk, but if you can't make it, uh, look out for the slides after the conference, and uh, you can find information about where to get the plugin. Uh, we'll be moving it to the Jenkins repo soon. Um, good stuff. Um, we also actually currently manage a lot of the stuff with the DynaSlave system through Groovy Scripts as well. Um, uh, Always reach for Groovy first when you can. The Groovy Scripts, if you don't have to expose something through a specific URL, um, there's a, few, there's a few things that you really don't need to touch plugins for, um, and it's usually easier to just go ahead and prototype that and run it as a job in your system. And, and uh, even though we've got this plugin here, in a lot of cases it's been easier to just do these scripts outside of the plugin than to actually go in and continue modifying the plugin and, and loading that up with additional features that may or not be relevant to us that long term or the company wide or everybody. Well, if uh, you guys found that interesting, you can always read more at these links especially the jobs link. Um, definitely check out the Netflix OSS Twitter account if you're interested in the projects that we release. Uh, the announcements are made there. Um, very, very good stuff. The tech blog, the slide share, great, great information there about what we're going on. And, you know, as always, thank you to our sponsors as well. Um, without CloudBee's support and all the sponsor support, we wouldn't be up here be able to share this with everybody, um, which is fantastic. And uh, so thank you, everybody, uh, for listening. Uh, you can find Gareth and I on Twitter as well.